Good evening. Hello, and thank you all for joining tonight's webinar. My name is Eloise Cathcart, and I am the Director of the Graduate Program in Nursing Administration at the Rory Myers College of Nursing here at New York University. Last year, a group of my former students formed the Nursing Administration Alumni Advisory Council. And their aim is to keep alumni of our program connected to the college and to each other for the purposes of sharing, refining, and extending their individual and collective leadership practices. Our group routinely reaches out to nurse executive leaders in our New York community to enhance those efforts, and that's exactly what we're doing tonight. Recent events, namely the COVID pandemic and the killing of George Floyd in particular, have challenged all nurses and especially nurse leaders as our staff look to us for support during these unprecedented and upsetting times. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we watched George Floyd's brutal death courageously filmed by 17-year-old Darnella Frazier, and that horror struck a chord in our nation and throughout the world. We are all seeing with new eyes the injustice of the racial disparities so deeply embedded in our communities and in many instances in our practice settings. As people and as nurses, we want to acknowledge and understand the systemic racism that overtly and insidiously tears the fabric of our society apart so that we can be better allies to our black neighbors and colleagues who know this story only too well. We know where we've been and we know we can't go back there. However, we don't know exactly how to move forward so with humility and hope, and with gratitude to our distinguished panelists and to everyone here tonight, people of good faith who have come together to begin to make things better, let's get started. I would like to now introduce Renee Sanchez, who is a nurse manager of pediatrics at Lenox Hill Hospital and who is the leader of our nursing administration alumni advisory council. Hello, good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Over the last few weeks, I've been having conversations with my black colleagues to make sure they're okay. And I have to admit that I do not understand what they're going through. My workplace and unit is working to develop bias activities so that staff can learn how to recognize their own personal biases. It's gonna be hard work for everyone, but like Professor Cathcart said, we know where we have been and we know we cannot go back there. Tonight represents our first step to understanding the experiences and the exhaustion of our black colleagues. My fellow council member, Nicole Kirchhofer, will be helping me moderate the discussion tonight. She is a nurse ex service excellence manager at Maimonides Medical Center. It is an honor to introduce our four panelists this evening. Dr. Dewey Brown DeVoe is a graduate of the Nursing Administration Master's Program from New York University and recently received her Doctor of Nursing degree. She currently serves as a nurse leader at NYU Langone Health and as an adjunct instructor at NYU Myers College of Nursing. Dr. Brown DeVoe is actively engaged in the community and represents nursing at state capital to continuously move nurses forward. She is deeply committed to the elimination of health and healthcare disparities in underserved populations. She recognizes that a diverse healthcare workforce is needed to increase cultural competence and quality of care including the representation of ethnic minorities in senior nursing leadership positions. Our next panelist is Kirsty Toussaint. She is the Director of Nursing Administration at NYU Winthrop Hospital and a doctor student at the Fox School of Business at Temple University where she's studying Business Administration, Management and Operations. She is a graduate of Nursing Administration Master's Program at NYU and currently serves as an adjunct faculty in the program. Kirsty previously served as the Vice President and Chief Experience Officer at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, and prior to that as the Director of Patient Care Services at Northwell Health Lenox Hill Hospital for several years. 
Kirsty enjoys managing the business side of nursing and working collaboratively with interdisciplinary teams to design and execute strate strategies that will support an organization's mission and vision. Nicole, you'll introduce the next two panelists. Thank you. Dr. Natalia Sinias serves as Senior Vice President and System Chief Nursing Executive for New York City Health and Hospitals, the largest public health care system in the nation, serving more than 1 million New Yorkers annually in more than 70 patient care locations. She serves as clinical lead for the organization, directing more than 9,600 nurses and more than 970 social workers, as well as planning, overseeing, and evaluating all aspects of clinical operations, services, and nurse education to ensure the delivery of quality, safe, standardized, and cost-effective nursing care to patients and the community. Dr. Sinias previously held nursing leadership roles at New York City's Mount Sinai, St. Luke's Hospital, and New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center. She received a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from NYU. Our last panelist, Dr. Lisa Lewis, is the inaugural Calvin Bland Fellow, Associate Professor and Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusivity at University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. She is also faculty director of Penn's College Houses and Academic Services, where she provides the academic leadership for Penn's 12 College Houses. Dr. Lewis is a graduate of the Nursing Education Master's Program from NYU. During her 17-year academic career as a faculty member and administrator, she has built a track record of developing, growing, and sustaining mission-driven initiatives in cardiovascular health, disparities research, and the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Supported by a diverse funding portfolio, Dr. Lewis's program of research focuses on reducing disparities in the behavioral management of hypertension for Blacks. If you have any questions during the session, please enter them in the Q&A box on your screen. We will get to as many questions as we can as, at the conclusion of this program. We want, to be, we want this to be an open dialogue where we can begin to understand how to break down the systemic racism in our practice settings. So our first question tonight is for Dr. Lewis. Um, can you please define racism, racial bias, and other related terminology? Sure. Um, so I'll just apologize in advance. My internet connection just sort of went wonky after I'd been on here for 30 minutes. So I apologize if I do fade out for a little bit. Hopefully it's okay. Uh, greetings from Philadelphia. It is a pleasure to be here with you this evening. I always take the opportunity to say that I am a native New Yorker, born and raised in Brooklyn, and so I'm sorry I cannot be with my other New York colleagues in person. Um, I actually think I'd like to start, Nicole, with um, a discussion or a description of systemic racism, because I think that's probably a little bit more applicable to our discussion and conversation tonight, in particular, and particularly healthcare settings. Um, and I'll start by bringing in a book by Dr. Ruth Zambrana, Toxic Ivory Towers. Um, and in this book, Dr. Zambrana discusses with us um, a set of shared characteristics that underrepresented minorities um, have that will serve as a foundation for this definition of systemic uh, racism. And what she shares um, with respect to these shared characteristics is that underrepresented minorities have um, share a history, if you will, of involuntary incorporation into the United States. That's by slavery for African Americans. That is by colonization or land acquisition. And so we have to think about these, the systemic racism as a series of policies that follow this history of involuntary incorporation into the United States. They were policies, they were laws, it was legal. And these have gone on for generations. And so when we think about systemic racism, it is policies that follow suit from this involuntary incorporation. Um, and we see it among things like education. We see it, of course, in healthcare. Um, and we have to think that these policies um, have to really be um, dismantled if we're going to really 
think about overcoming racism. And so that's sort of the foundation, it's systemic. Um, the piece about it is that um, when we think about systemic racism, we can't really name um, an identifiable perpetrator, right? It is policies. And so it would be very easy for us to identify a single person that is responsible for this. But it's not, and that's what makes it difficult, and that's what makes it hard for us to really address. Um, I think about some of the writings of Dr. Kamara Jones, um, and for the audience, if you don't know her, she's a physician and an epidemiologist who's worked in this, um, this space of racism and healthcare for, for decades now. Um, and she has an allegory where she talks about the three levels of racism. It's a written piece in the American Journal of Public Health, um, but she also has a TED Talk, and so you could Google it and find it. Um, the three levels of racism are personally mediated, institutional, and internalized. The piece that's really important for us to talk about is the institutional racism, right? Again. Um, a set of policies and so forth. The personally mediated are those interactions that we have. And so when we think about the racial bias piece, um, as Nicole started out with, that's the personally mediated racism. Those are the day-to-day -day interactions that we encounter with individuals um, based in bias or, hold, or individuals who hold a set of beliefs about a group of people um, that may, may not be true. Um, and so I'll just, I think I'll stop there. I could talk a lot about systemic racism, um, but I'm sure my, my, my panelists, co colleagues have some other things to, to say. Thank you. So I'll start off with the first question and any of the panelists can answer this. How can providers better see and understand racial disparities in their practice? I would say, hi everyone, good, good evening, I should say. Um, um, I think from a provider perspective, there's so much data that they can use to see uh, racial disparities. You know, I think about health insurance, number one, and the impact of that and having that and what that means for black patients. What does that mean in terms of the stage of disease when they finally see a provider? I think about, you know, the lack of social support, the lack of follow up in, in terms of their care. I think about the, the comorbidities that their patients have and we see that now with COVID-19 and there are just so many different social factors that they see um, in terms of social determinants of health with their patients and the lack thereof, uh, the lack thereof in terms of support. But I think um, data is definitely one aspect in which they can track. I was recently speaking to the chief population health officer at my organization, and she was just describing the data she tracks in terms of the compliance, something as, as simple but not so simple as blood pressure management in terms of the compliance of that, you know, patients really coming back and, and not, you know, having a fear of going to the doctor and having a copay or having a bill and what that means in terms of the care of the black patient. And I can jump into that, but one of the things that I'm going to do prior to doing that is that I'm going to kind of give you a frame of myself, um, pretty much my journey, and then we can kind of morph into more of how, what providers can do. So when I began my journey from the island of Jamaica to New York, I was completely unaware, maybe ignorant, of um, as a Black woman of racism, completely ignorant. I was an immigrant of immigrants, and I landed in a spatially residentially seg segregated area in Brooklyn. I went to high school for one year there that was also spatially segregated. There was no white people in that school at all. It was just all African-Americans and um, other um, minorities. I progress on and so the zip code, everything else was redlining. So as Lisa was discussing, it's pretty much the way structural racism is set up is that you are morphed into a place that now it's a redlining zone and in within that community no one can actually get loans to buy a home you cannot get loans to go to school you cannot get loans to start a business so it's actually started from a very early age you're able to see it but from the island of jamaica i was completely oblivious to it 
I move on. I went to a community college for one year. And then after that, I was like, okay, there's a little bit more that I could do. So I spoke to my parents and I went to Stony Brook and I graduated from Stony Brook with a BS degree and um, bachelor's of science. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't want that to sound negative. And I graduated with a BS degree and then I went on to work. I couldn't find a decent job and I decided to go back to nursing school at Malloy. And from there, you can see microaggression when you are at Malloy, but for some strange reason, as a young girl coming from Jamaica, it's not something that really bothered me. But it, it didn't bother me that much. It actually become a little bit more potent when I start working at NYU and it was with the patients. It not, wasn't with the colleagues. It was actually with the patients, the racial slurs that you would hear. Um, the fact that you are a black nurse was a little bit, okay, can I get another nurse? And then it become a little bit more obvious and I start realizing when I start my threshold, went into leadership and I realized within leadership that there was actually no African-American as a director. There was a lot of nurse managers but there was no director within that space. So I was like, okay, fine, all right, is this gonna be my trajectory? So I start thinking about those things. And that's when, as a black person living in America, I start realizing that, oh, if there's a little bit more that I have to do. So when it comes to provider overall, it's just to set the stage, is that it's one of those things that providers overall, you have to be a little bit more aware. You have to be a little bit more aware as well of the patients that you do care for. And you also have to understand the patient's background. It's not a situation that you walk in and the world is beautiful. We have to understand the path where black Americans are coming from. And based on that, you're able to provide a better service. You have to understand that they also do not trust um, doctors, just because if we go into the Tuskegee and all of those things that do happen. So a lot of times we wonder, why Black Americans, why they don't go to the doctor, why they don't do this, why they don't do certain things. These are things that has been cemented in the U.S. population, the U.S. culture. And now we have, it has to be, we have to be a little bit delicate when it comes to that. We have to be a little bit more, start conceptualizing. And it takes us as and I'm not only talking, it's not going to take us Black Americans in order to change racism in America. It's actually going to take everyone. So based on that, we have to learn. We have to take the opportunity to understand where Blacks are coming from. And based on that, we're able to kind of see what are some of the racial disparities? What are some of the things that's causing these things? Why do we have Black Americans that have more comorbidities? Why do they have more hypertension? Why do they have diabetes? And we can go right back to what Lisa discussed earlier. It's just based on the systemic racism that has morphed in the population for all these years that caused this. You're talking about they're living in a food desert. There's not enough food there. We don't have whole foods. We don't have all of these luxury that is afforded to other population because of the spatial segregation that have divided us. So providers have to really take the opportunity to learn their patient population and know that each person is individual and that based on that, we're better able to kind of provide for them and we're, be, we're able to actually break down some of those disparities that do happen right now. I can, this is Kirsty. good evening everyone. So I could piggyback on both what Natalia and uh, Dewey mentioned, you know, um, so I come from, my perspective has always been in the acute, acute care setting. Um, so when I hear the word provider, um, that's what comes to mind. And from that, from that frame of mind and from that perspective, um, I think uh, just uh, uh, linking back to systemic racism, I think there's an obligation for our organization to ensure that there is deliberate and intentional mm -hmm. um, knowledge, awareness, learning, understanding, um, information seeking, information gathering when it comes to uh, breaking down racial disparities. If we leave it up to individual um, providers, they may intentionally or unintentionally be oblivious to what those disparities are and may assume as they go along in their practice, um, as they take care of their patients, they may assume, hey, I, I know it, I understand. But um, I think that if we go upstream, if you will, and linking back to systemic racism, the system of allowing providers on their own to go out and learn about their patients, learn about the communities, learn about the population, 
um, is not enough. And we have to really set up and design intentionally and deliberately structures where providers are um, they're taught, they're placed in situations where they can listen and they can learn, and that it's ongoing, that it's not um, an initiative, it's not a one-time thing, it's not part of, you know, your annual mandatory requirement uh, through HR. It's something that happens ongoing every day, that it becomes part of the fabric. And so over time, what you have, um, again, particularly speaking of the acute care setting, what you have are providers who um, don't know anything different than where where's this person coming from? Let me listen to understand um, what else is happening, what else is transpiring there. They're aware of the, what their blind spots may be. And so they're always questioning, learning. Um, so that type of environment to me is a culture. Um, and so in the acute care setting, um, it, it really is a culture of understanding and learning and it starts upstream, it starts with the leaders of the organization who set that expectation for everyone. Yes, and I, I just like to, ch beautifully said by my colleagues, I'm not going to repeat all of this um, wonderful advice. I just like to add um, in terms of changing the culture, and I know we have um, a lot of nurse leaders on the call, um, it's also about changing the language um, of health disparities. I think what we have done, and I count myself um, as one of those, as a, a researcher who works in this space, we've become really complacent about the language of health disparities. Mm. And the disparities are often discussed um, and framed. And the narrative is, well, what's wrong with the black and brown body that they are so disproportionately affected by chronic illness, morbidity, mortality, and, and so forth, whereas we need to reframe the language. And so it's not about what's wrong with the black and brown body. It's, it's about what's wrong with this system that attacks the black and brown bodies. And so it's, 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 it's not health disparities based in race. It's actually health disparities that are based in racism. And I think that's the, it, 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 it's an uphill battle, but it's an important one. Um, I, I have students who come to me in my role as assistant dean for diversity who are quite upset in class because uh, instructors and professors present the disparities without the context, and we need to do more of that. Mm -hmm. I'd like for us to really think about changing the language around health disparities. So it's not blamed on race, but blamed on the actual thing that, that is causing it, which is the racism and the discrimination. Wow, that was very powerful. Very, a lot of, wow, yeah. a lot to take in. Um, thank you all. That's a lot of information and uh, certainly helpful in helping us better understand um, in the way it was framed. So it's not about the race, it's about racism. Um, the next question I have for all of our panelists, um, what strategies do you recommend for both nurse leaders and healthcare leaders to create an anti-racist environment? Mm. Um, I could start off with that. Uh, so a lot of times we hear this terminology, I am not racist, right? We hear that a lot. But I think we have to create a space to say that we are anti-racist. So we have to get on that platform to create an environment that demands that white America end their silence and take action to counterbalance the structures that perpetuate racism. I think we cannot have, there's no more statement and stand for something that might, you, might, you might feel comfortable with. You have to get into an uncomfortable zone. You have to recognize structural racism in the workplace, in the healthcare setting, in education. You have to recognize that it's all around you. And I'll go back to raising awareness, enhancing progress, and literally increasing your learning. Um, and we can draw from the work as leaders. I think it start with, and because there's a lot of leaders in the room, I think it start with leaders. It start with leaders establishing a condition where people feel comfortable and they don't feel afraid of actually saying that, okay, this makes me feel uncomfortable. Because I know that for myself, just knowing the topic that I did, did in school, a lot of times I would make a statement and I would even call Natalia, who's on the phone, and said, 
What do you think about that? Because I never want to be put in a box that I'm stigmatized because I make a statement to say, okay, I see this, where is the diversity? So a lot of times as a black person in leadership, you're always fearful of what are some of the things that you can say and you cannot say. And we have as leaders, and we have mostly white Americans that's leaders in major organization, they have to be able to set that foundation. I think it's the easiest and it's the most effective way. They have to be able to look around and see what's happening within their organization and say, okay, I'm sitting in this boardroom. There's a total of 50 people here, but there's no minority sitting here, right? So they have to develop strategies and it has to be purposeful. It has to be intentional because one of the things that I'm fearful about, I'm fearful about all these statements that's going out because they're all daunting. And it's all about, okay, we're increasing. These are the things that we're doing. We're building in the structure to prevent racism from happening in the organization. But it will be patronizing. It will be condescending if we don't have actionable items behind it. So as leaders, we have to make sure that we put strategies in place. However, the strategies have to have actionable items. If you're going to put something in place, okay, we're going to develop a fellowship. Just knowing where... African Americans are coming from self confidence, self efficacy, they might need a little bit more work. And based on that, we need to put structures in place and we need to create environments that people and I think leaders as well, they have to be, they need to be vulnerable about their own ambiguities. They have to realize what are some of the things that they also has been built in from a child up that they have and what are some of the stigma that they also hold against African Americans because we do all have some and we have to start realizing within ourselves and we as leaders we have to set the stage it, it must it has to come from us and then that triggers down to everyone else and I'm going to push the envelope a little bit on that sorry there are ambulances um, in my area um, I'm going to push the envelope a little bit I, I think I, I absolutely agree I think Creating a foundation um, is important from a leadership perspective. You know, I think about everything that we talk about in nursing, shared governance and embedding it within a shared governance structure. You know, I think about creating psychological safety so staff feel safe to speak up exactly what do we mention. But I'm gonna, I just think about, you know, our theme for Nurses Week, again, it keeps coming up, right? Nurses, a voice to lead, nursing the world to health. That's so powerful. And when I think about frontline nurses, you know, they are leaders as well. And so I implore everyone to really think about their voice in this. And I think leaders have to, again, creating psychological safety, listen to the voice of our nurses about what we need to change within our profession. There are so many things we have to do, but it's going to take all of us and not just leadership. I think a frontline nurse who's passionate about something can go up to a leader and say, what are we doing about this? You know, I was so proud when I saw the protests happening throughout Manhattan, you know, within the last few months. And I remember when I was a senior director, one of the nurses came up to me and said, you know, what are we doing about what happened in Orlando? And, and that was the catalyst to then do something. So I think, you know, we all have a stake in this and I think we all can have an impact. So, so Renee, oh, go ahead, Kirsty. Renee, did you want to? I was going to ask another uh, question, so, but if you want to um, comment. I, I, what I wanted to comment was I, you know, I had the, the pleasure of being um, and the honor of being the culture leader at Lenox Hill Hospital when they were rolling out their culture of care, patient experience, and employee engagement strategy. And, and I think about that role and the honor that I had to to help create an environment of transparency, psychological safety, um, being able to have difficult conversations regardless of what they are. Um, and I just keep thinking about the opportunity that we have as leaders. So we have people who apply for jobs. Again, I'm thinking of the acute care setting because that's where I work. We have people who apply for jobs to come and work. And people apply for jobs for different reasons. They may need the money or they're absolutely passionate about doing a particular, have, being in a particular role at an organization, or they might want to work for that organization in this location. But they all somehow end up in one place. And they come from so many places, so many backgrounds, so many cultures, they're raised differently. And we have an opportunity, all of these people coming from so many, per, coming with so many perspectives and different experiences, 
we have the opportunity to have an impact on their lives. So when, when I think about work and when I think about a profession, when I think about what we do, I don't think of it as a job. I think of it as living. Because at the end of the day, this is the story that we'll, we'll tell. You know, when we go to work every day, the impact that we make. And so when I think about creating an anti-racist environment, I really think about our work with people and helping people connect to a higher purpose. Why are we here? Um, what are we doing collectively? Um, helping them sort of rise to that, that occasion to do things a little bit different and learn something different that they may not have experienced mm -hmm. in a prior life. Mm -hmm. um, and as an example, I've given this example in class before, when I started doing that work around culture of care and we talked about communicating and having open conversations and, and giving feedback and being receptive to feedback, I realized I couldn't do that at work and not do it at home. So when I got home, I started practicing what I learned at work in human resources, how we communicate, how we have crucial conversations, to the point where my kids and my husband would say to me, are you doing that thing? You know, you, you're, you're, you're having that conversation. When I would say, tell me more, they would say, what are you doing? And I would say, I'm just asking you to tell me more. And to me, it's being able to um, have that opportunity to help people understand something different, see something different that they may not have seen before. Um, so creating that anti-racist environment, it, it's just a part of a larger picture to me. It's, it, it's really about how we, how we can really change people's lives for the better, help them see something different that they may not have seen before. So true. My, might I add something that I think we, we might consider a little controversial. Um, I think a, 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 a really major strategy is, is a little bit of self-awareness, development, and self-evaluation. Um, and part of that, and part of this anti-racist fight, thank you for the term, Christy, um, is asking ourselves a few questions, but probably one of the biggest this question is, um, what role or roles do we ourselves play in supporting the system and this structure, no matter what your color is? Um, we all hold some privileges that I think um, support some of this the systemic racism. And I know the word privilege and white privilege, sometimes people bristle at the term, but even if we just drop the white from it, privilege, it's just a benefit that we have an advantage that's typically unearned. Um, the problem is that it often causes us to have some blind spots when we're interacting with others, right? And so I think um, if we're going to do this well um, as nurse leaders, we have to own the privileges that we, we come to the table with. And I'll just share, you know, as a black woman, if you can't see me, I'm a black woman, I'm a proud black woman. Um, and I lean from the lens of I'm black, I'm a woman. So it's always racism, it's always sexism. This is what my world is like. Um, I never lean from the privileges that I have, right? So I, a poor family, I'm not poor anymore. I make a decent salary. I am educated. Um, but one of the, the one of the things in which I don't have to think about on a daily basis that some of our colleagues might, right? I do not have to worry about um, someone looking at me kiss my partner because I identify as a cisgender heterosexual woman. My partner is male. Um, our LGBT colleagues don't have that, right? So I have that privilege. What I learned quite late in life, and when I say quite late, I'm talking about only two or three years ago, in my role as an assistant dean for diversity, who knows all of the pronouns, who knows all of the terms, considers myself a strong ally of the LGBTQ community, I learned that I did have a blind spot. I had a blind spot in how I uh, recognize the male and female gender binary. Um, and so I don't want to go off topic, but what I, I bring the example to say that we all have privileges that support this structural racism. Um, and we have to recognize that and really think deeply about what our role 
or roles are in supporting that, um, the structure. So I'm going to kind of flip gears a little bit. And I know the topic is really about identifying it in your practice setting. But I want to talk, do you think that we can influence um, in the academic setting, like new nurses, a way to be like anti-racist or kind of start from like the beginnings of being a nurse um, in, in the learning phase of um, the practice itself, like how to enculturate that environment and that um, just talking discussion about um, an anti-racist um, environment? Yeah, so I, I would love to speak to that because I'm so passionate about this, you know, just listening to what Lisa just shared. I remember uh, when I was leading a council, I was doing um, educational programs around LGBTQ mm -hmm. and the person I was doing the trainings with came with their own preconceived notions, the fabric of which they were made. And they had, they could not deliver the content because of what the Bible stated and the person had issues with that. So we had to really talk about the mission, the vision of the organization and what we were charged to do. And the person was able to deliver the content. So I say that because I, I talk about, you know, the fact that we have to, regardless of your preconceived notions or how you feel, you have to leave that at the door when you're caring for patients is my own personal philosophy. Right. And when I think about the academic setting, I think that there is an opportunity there to really think about creating standard work for clinical rotation debriefs. Okay, you took care of patient X at the end of the day. You know, um, you know, how do you think unconscious bias may have, may, may have you know, played a role in terms of the plan of care for the patient? What are the social determinants that are impacting this patient? Um, you know, um, how did you feel about, um, or did you, did you ask for translator services? You know, asking those important questions during the clinical rotations. When I think about med surge, when I think about pediatrics, I don't recall a professor asking me, you know, how that medication impacts a black person. So I think I think there's opportunities there to really think about from a whether it's a pharmacological perspective whether it's a clinical perspective to integrate how you know different medications impact different races right. and, and integrate it within academia I, I think there's an opportunity there to also educate nurses about social work services care management case management you know i also oversee over 900 social workers and you know i i don't recall learning about the other team members you know upon graduation and i think there's opportunities there to really think about you know not just mr jones but who does he live with you know does he live in a walk up and and what does that mean about the care we provide you know i'm very sensitive to all of this because uh, my patient, my, my family is of Haitian descent. I am of Haitian descent. And so I understand that a patient who is from Haiti will go in and shake their heads and act as if they understand, but they have no clue what the physician is saying. And so I think it starts in the academic setting. I think it starts in clinical rotations. And I think we have to stop leaving things up to chance in terms of what patient will you get today? No, we're looking for this type of patient to ensure the nursing student learns how to care for this patient. So I think we have to be a little bit more strategic in the academic setting. I, I also think about, and I just want to close on this statement, I think about our Nightingale Pledge. Mm -hmm. When we talk about, you know, what, you know, upholding the standards of our profession, when we talk about abstaining from deleterious or mischievous acts, what does that mean in 2020? You know, we should not be reciting a pin or reciting the pledge at a ceremony and getting a pin. We should talk about that before you receive your pin. And so once you receive that pin, what does that mean in 2020? What does that mean to the patient you're caring for, the family member, and everyone else that's impacted by this patient being hospitalized? I think there's a huge opportunity to tweak things the way that we do things in the academic setting. Yeah, I also think we could do it in like orientation as well, like as we bridge that transition from a new nurse to a new grad and as you step into each role, that could be something that we can Absolutely. consider. I like what you talked about as far as the social work and maybe the case management, just like having the nurses be, um, I don't know, work with them and train with them just to kind of like understand that. I think that's, you bring up a really great point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Kirsty had touched on it before in terms of it being continuous and a part of the culture, you know, 
creating a culture of understanding and learning. Um, so that just doesn't, you know, can start with school, but it certainly doesn't end there. Um, our other question is, um, many organizations and institutions provide ongoing diversity and racial bias training. Mm -hmm. How can we measure the effects of these trainings to ensure positive outcomes and sustain change? Mm -hmm. I, think I guess I could start with that question because my, you know, one of the things that, um, and Dewey touched on this as well, um, it, it, uh, it, it's hard to say um, that, uh, this is something that we, or, or a system that we've put in place to really uh, break down barriers to ensure um, that racial bias and systemic um, racism is not part of our hiring practices, but it's hard to say that that's not true if we look across the board and we don't see anyone that looks like us in leadership positions beyond middle management. So I think that's one way we can definitely um, uh, be intentional about measuring those outcomes, and, and that's also demonstrated in other industries as well, um, particularly when it comes to uh, lead women on board. Uh, if you look at France, they set goals back uh, maybe about five years ago um, where they wanted a certain percentage of women on executive boards, and they, they held themselves accountable to that. Um, subsequent to that, of course, is attrition. So you don't want to just put them there. You want to make sure that they're successful, that they're staying, that there's definitely retention and not turnover just to sort of um, um, uh, add to the numbers, if you will. But definitely when we talk about measurement, uh, when we look at our leaders, when, any, when someone starts a new, a new profession, they, they recite the Nightingale Pledge and they walk into um, a practice setting and they say, I want to do X. Are they able to see people that look like them um, as role models um, to aspire to those roles? I agree. I think, you know, diversity is very important. I think about uh, metrics such as, uh, you know, what, what are patients saying about the care, you know, the facilities or organizations are providing? You know, I think that's, that's key to understanding whether or not we are providing culturally sensitive care. When you think about nurse communication, physician communication, so important. From an academic perspective, I think review, reviewing course objectives and seeing if it's integrated and embedded there. I also am, am big on in terms of diversity of executives. So, you know, I worked for phenomenal organizations that made it a point to ensure that the leadership teams mirrored the patients we served and just monitoring that and having that discussion. And again, you know, I think it all starts with ourselves and understanding our own biases, which, which it's important. And as you mentioned before, Christy, is ongoing that everyone, um, you know, really participates in ongoing education and training. And organizations should start addressing diversity just like they address um, a business opportunity. Um, it should be a process, again, and I'm going back to my words, purposeful and intentional. So we have to move from, okay, some say, someone makes a complaint about diversity. Okay, let's send them to a microaggression class or let's just send them to a diversity class because that's not really going to do any equal justice. We have to be able to say, okay, this is slipping. We need to make sure that we have a conscious effort about it. We need to translate it. We need all hands on deck. We need to be able to have processes in place, as Natalia mentioned earlier, that we're able to see it, that we're able to actually look. When we walk into an organization, we should be able to visualize if diversity is a whole within that organization. So it's not about just, okay, let's just have a class. We need to go away from that methodology. It hasn't done anything because mm -hmm. right now people take those diversity class as if you're actually giving them performance surgery. So it's not something that is really impactful. I'm not saying don't have them, but what else comes after them? What are some of the things from awareness to skill? So now we've taught you, we have made you aware. So what are the skill set behind that? So how are we able to validate some of those um, skill sets that we have just taught this individual about diversity? So I think we have to start looking at diversity more of something that run the organization. We have to start looking at diversity like a profit ma margin and treat it as such. And I think if we start thinking about it in that perspective, then we will be able to kind of address it more from just having diversity training to now move it on to some, look at some metrics. 
Absolutely, I agree. Um, there was actually an article that was written in 2016 um, from Dobin and Kalav, I think it was Kalib, um, and it was published in the uh, Harvard Business Review, and it asserted that diversity programs have failed in increasing diversity. And uh, they said it, after the diversity training, the effects lasted a day or two. And, uh, that, and at times it was counterproductive. So just like you said, it should be continuous and you should see the results. I mean, we've been doing, organizations have been doing diversity training for years and years, but yet we're still faced with the same issues of not having diversity. Mm -hmm. It's so interesting you say that, Nicole, because yeah. literally yesterday I was reading a Harvard Business Review article that talked about what's next. Now you've heard us, you know, it becomes action oriented, which is Dewey's point exactly. So the really actionable steps to see whether or not we are making traction. We are nurses. We know education doesn't change behavior. Education alone. So you need education, but you need more. Um, and I think the bigger, larger issue, again, goes back to the system. We cannot train people. <laughs> we can train the system out of people. We need more. We need stronger. We need changes in policy. Right. We need changes in legislature. We need changes in law. We need changes in how hospitals provide care and who they provide care to. So it, it's multi-level and a multi-phased process, if you will. Um, we've sort of focused on the easy part, the training. It's very easy to put a workshop together, learn about your biases, implicit and otherwise, um, and then go about your business. It's not enough. Yes. Do we said we failed we failed miserably we need more we need bigger we need stronger and i just want to add to that very quickly and then i move and i can move it on to someone i and i can just talk about personal experience because i like to draw back from personal experience and try to look within myself and see what are some of the things that i can do to make things better because it's not on everyone else it's all of us right i think there is there's a concept now to say the world is fair minded and it's impartial and that racial injustice is going to be something that is going to be slowly undone with time and i think over year over years time we start thinking that way we start saying oh my gosh there's so much progress right and we start thinking about different construct and i can recall just in recent years that there's two classes that i had to take there was one ethics and then there's another one, population health. Within both classes, there's a lot of racial disparities that was brought up. But it makes everyone in the class so uncomfortable. It was such an uncomfortable topic. And this was me doing my doctorate. So we're thinking about, okay, so this was not addressed in undergrad. It was not addressed in your master's. And now we are doing our doctorate program. And now we have to discuss this. And people were so uncomfortable with it because I'm a person that I just float through the class and I speak to everyone. And I recall, and my friends, very close friends, I'm not even sure if any, any is on the thing. Four, we always do things together and they were white Americans. And they actually decided to go to dinner without me that day. I was so hurt. And I was like, and I had to have a, con I had, I had a conversation with each and every one of them. Because, oh, we were just so tired of the conversation. Because the conversation, we were discussing social determinants of health. We were discussing how Black Americans, all of the disparities that we, it was a very harsh conversation. It was really truthful, but harsh. But it does make people feel uncomfortable. So we can go back to what Natalia was saying from the beginning. This has to be something that as nurses, as healthcare providers, that we're discussing from high school to our bachelorette to our master's and over to our doctorate. It has to be a topic that people don't get uncomfortable discussing because it does make people uncomfortable because it starts becoming a punishment. I'm being punished because I'm white and we don't want it to be that layer. We don't want people to see racial disparities. We don't want people to see racism as something that they're being punished for because they will say, okay, but I didn't do this. This didn't happen. It wasn't me. So why am I being punished for it? So we have to start infusing that within the curriculum on every single level. It has to be a conversation that is discussed in the hospital setting, it has to be a conversation that is discussed in leadership. 
that when people are having these conversations, they are not uncomfortable having them because it's something that we're continuously talking about, discussing, how can we make it better? And I can just talk, in a, I can just talk about just literally little quality, quality stuff that we do in the hospital. We talk about clapsy quality every day. We talk, we talk about falls every day. People right. don't get uncomfortable about those things but you talk about racism, and I remember when the whole Joy Flo um, Floyd started, and I went to work and I talk about it, and a physician got up and walked away. He crumpled his paper and he was out. He was so uncomfortable discussing it. So we, as healthcare provider on all level, not only nurses, but physicians, need to start making sure that this is infused within our curriculum. I will put in a plug here, and I'm not just going to do this because I work for New York City Health and Hospitals, but what we recently started doing was asking, you know, how did unconscious bias play a role with the care we provided? And I've seen that one question uh, turn the conversation around. I've seen CEOs talk about what they're going to do with the, you know, with a patient um, that everyone knows, but, you know, is just the neighborhood drunk. You know, wh what are we going to do about this patient now? And I think that's, that's powerful, and I think it's needed, and I think we have to and I've said this multiple times this week, is just become comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think, um, you know, that's where we start to have the conversation like we are this evening. So I wanted to take some questions from our Q&A and, and not forget about the, our audience. Um, there's a lot of questions I see in, the, in our Q&A um, box. So I'll start off with the first one. Um, the question that was asked is, do you think universal health care coverage can help to reduce institutional racism? No. no. <laughs> it hasn't. We've had a version of it. It hasn't. The health disparities haven't gotten any better. Because I, I, think it's a, I think it's a step, I would say. You know, I know someone personally who recently was not going to the doctor because they did not have insurance. That, pay, that, that, that person now needs a kidney transplant. So I think that, uh, you know, having insurance is, is, is one step of not being fearful of getting care, but I think it's two separate things. Mm -hmm. It is, and we have plenty yeah. of information that when we look at these disparities and controlling for it, income and controlling for insurance status and they still exist there was a paper david williams who's at out of harvard has done decades of work on racism and health um and this 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 paper explored disparities in what we would consider um non-poor uh, blacks and and latinx population and um it might be a step, but it's, 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 it's certainly not doing anything to, to reduce the disparities that we see in, in the population, particularly in Blacks. And let's not even talk about Native American population. Right. Right. Um, do we want to take the question from Sophia and from the chat? Sure. It says, as leaders in healthcare space, have you personally experienced racism from your peers, whether overtly or covertly? How did it present? How did you address it? And what recommend recommendation can you share to empower others who might face a similar situation? I would say I have experienced covert racism. I, I think someone mentioned microaggressions earlier. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if this is the healthy way to deal with it, but I think the way that I've personally had to deal with it is, um, you know, like knowledge is power and just continuously having to prove myself that I know what I'm doing, that I'm smart, that I'm intelligent. It's exhausting. But unfortunately, that is the hand that I've been dealt. And, um, you know, and, and, the, and the great thing I would say is I've had great mentors, diverse mentors um, that have instilled a lot of, of um of knowledge in me in terms of how to navigate uh, the, the politics of, of the workplace. And it, it, it's definitely a skill that I've had to sort of learn. Um, and so my recommendation would be is definitely mentorship, definitely a support system, definitely um, understanding you know, if there's a if there's a role that you would like, understanding what it takes to to be there. You know, I'm a big believer in earning whatever it is that you that you gain, and I think um, and being respected for your knowledge. And so that's that's how I would answer that. But I think and I think I think I've heard Dewey say this before. But you know, you you have to sort of do everything, and um, 
you know, dot all your I's and, and cross your T's, but it, it, it's been my experience, yes, but not overt, luckily. Yeah, um, it, haven't, it hasn't been overt for me um, as well. I think you always, you always have to recognize, you always know who you are. You always, I always kind of think about, okay, I'm going to NYU and then I'm going to go to another school. And if I put this on paper, if I come against someone else, will I be able? So it's like in the back of your brain, you're always, your wheel is always turning. You're always thinking about what do you have to do because you are black. You have to think about the fact that I, I always think that I have to work twice as hard just to be considered half as good. And based on that, just based on those things, it's like no one is going to come to you and say, oh, I don't like you because you're black or stuff. Or if people do even have those concepts, I don't even think about them. It's not something that I really look for. And as, as Natalia said, I do have a diverse a mentor system. Um, and I can go all the way back. The first person that asked me to actually apply for a nurse manager position was Dr. Ronald Keller. He is white. He came to me. He said, I see your potential. In the back of my brain, I was like, oh my gosh, um, can I really do this? And I applied for the position. I didn't get it because there was someone that was more qualified. And I decided to just fall underneath the radar. And then I have Dr. Kimberly Glassman that came to me and say, oh, I need to discuss your leadership journey. What do you plan on doing? So for every step along the way, it's someone, and none of them are African Americans, but they reach out to me, they saw my potential, and they say, these are the things that I need you to do. This is your next step. And I think that's one of the things that we really do need. We need not only mentorship, but we need sponsorship. But I haven't really had situations in which it was really overt or oblivious or someone just, just because you're, but I haven't had that. Yeah. I have a question. I can piggyback on that. I don't. I haven't had um, overt experiences. Um, I've had the pleasure. I've been blessed of having both experiences, both uh, um, covert ex uh, racism, and I've mm -hmm. also had um, individuals who have pushed me, regardless of what I said. And there's a particular person on this particular panel uh, discussion right now, Professor Eloise Cathcart. Well, um, I always tell the story. I was, I think, halfway through my graduate program and with a few kids in tow and really difficult work, I said to her, I don't think I'm cut out for this. And she said, I just register, you know, you'll be okay. Just register. We'll take the summer off and we'll see what, what happens. And uh, the fall came and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do this. And she's like, oh, just, you know, just come and do this class. And, and here I am today, long story short. <laughs> Um, so I, I feel like I've, I've really been blessed to have, you know, both experiences because it makes me a well-rounded person. And part of empathy, you know, we don't want to, we can't experience everything in life, but um, to be able to experience, ver have various experiences allows us to uh, respond in a way that allows us to really execute, to eliminate some of uh, the systemic bias and implicit uh, racism that we're talking about. Um, in terms of, I think the question asked, what did I do about it? I want to really talk a little bit about that because in that, you know, there's, for someone who has brown skin like me, um, sometimes you lack agency when you are an employee. Um, and so sometimes it's a little bit difficult to really speak up because at the end of the day, I'm very clear that I've got to make sure I put food on my table um, and make sure my kids have clothes on, on their backs and, um, and I can pay my mortgage. Um, so it, it can be it can be intimidating to speak up, um, but when you're clear on your values and you're able to um, really I, I don't want to say rise above because sometimes it can be challenging um, to deal with some of those types of issues. But um, in the in the long run, when you're true to yourself and you're honest with what you're what you're there about and what your values are, it worked out for me. I can only speak from my uh, my own experience, but I've had both experience. I've had I've been blessed. To have both experiences and I can say that um, it's made me a better person because of it. Thank you Kirsty. Um, there's a question from the audience to Lisa um, about recognizing our privilege. Could that also be looked at as being self-reflective and recognizing our biases including biases that may have developed over time and unconsciously internalized? Well there's certainly overlapping right. Um, there are two different concepts though so I don't want us to sort of um, tie the two concepts together as the same. Uh, privilege is definitely one set of things. 
Um, bias is really about um, the beliefs we hold about individuals based on um, a demographic group that, to which they belong. Um, beliefs about how they should be, how they should behave, um, and so forth. The privilege is more about our blind spots, right? The things we don't have to worry about. Um, I was in a meeting with a colleague, and I know when she made the statement, it was not meant to be harmful. Uh, and so we were talking, um, and she's like, oh, yeah, because I forget that I'm white, right? Meaning that her color wasn't a big deal to her. And I said, that must be so great. <laughs> Never for, I can never forget that my skin is black, right? So she had the privilege of not being fearful of being white. Her skin's white. She's not afraid of, of being white, um, where, whereas it's different for me. So it's two different things. They are overlapping, but it's different. So I don't know if I addressed the question, um, but, but it's, it's not the same. I would like to, though, share. <laughs> we have one minute my experience of what racism looks like today. Um, and, and I'll just be really brief, but it presents for me as when I tell individuals that I am a tenured associate professor at FN, which is an Ivy League school. So once they get past the fact that I am actually a professor, um, the next question typically is, well, how did you get there? Um, and so my response, I turn it back on them. So I. So are you asking me about my application process? You know, so that is how I, that is my coping mechanism because I know it's not a question that they would ask if my skin wasn't brown or, or your skin wasn't black. Um, so it presents a little bit differently for me now, but it, it's these sorts of microaggressions, a question that you probably wouldn't have asked me if I was white. Mm. So I just thought it was important to share. No, absolutely. So taking another question from the Q&A, this was going back to kind of the academic um, question we asked earlier. Uh, a question um, is how as clinical instructors assist our nursing students who may at times come from an all white community? Mm. Million dollar question. I think, I think there's opportunity to leverage uh, this might not answer the question, but I think there's opportunity to leverage alumni that are diverse. And, you know, I think, you know, when I think about the clinical instructors I had way back when, I think about the biases they had. So I think it's starting with the, the training for the clinical instructors themselves. I think it's, 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 you know, making sure that the students are prepared to care for, you know, the patients who have mental health issues patients who do not look like them. And I think it's having those conversations before they go in. And, and it's, it's just, again, creating psychological safety before and after, having the uncomfortable conversations, making sure it's embedded before they get to the clinical setting and talking about it over and over again, but making sure the clinical instructors themselves have the skills to really care for the patients. Yeah, I think we, we have, this struggle here at Penn. So our, the community is our West Philadelphia community, which is primarily black, um, although it's gentrified quite a bit now. So maybe I might have to walk back that statement, but I think it's about the narrative that you present to your students, right? So you're going to a community, you may not look like the community, um, but how are we describing the community? Is it only in terms of the fact that they are an under-resourced community? Um, is it all about the poverty porn? Or are we also presenting the strengths and the resources that we know the community have, right? I don't think we do enough of that. Um, I also think it's the framing of the work you're going to do. So we often want to go into the community thinking that we are helping, right? And since the question was about um, the fact that students may be primarily white, it's the white savior mentality. This is not the way we want to approach this work. It's about a partnership. Right. So I think it's about highlighting the strengths that each community brings because they all have, right? The fact that you're surviving and being so under-resourced says to me that you have strengths. 
that needs to be highlighted as you're doing the work. Um, and also knowing that you have a lot to learn. So you're not going there to help. You're not going there to just teach. You're also going there to learn. I like the learning part. I, I just want to say, you know, because of my role and the roles I've had, I've had to mentor a lot of white nurse leaders, not just nursing students. And I've seen fear in some of their eyes when they go into the settings where they're not accustomed to the patient population. And so I think there's a lot of support that they need, even as leaders, uh, to get acclimated to the setting and, and to make sure that they can shift gears and begin providing care. Because I, I think some of them are afraid because they, there's a disconnect there. And I think we have to acknowledge that. Right. Another question from the audience. Um, how can we be more deliberate and intentional in starting to initiate change in our immediate work environments without offending or making others uncomfortable? I think Dewey said oh, the easiest oh. thing that you could possibly do was talk about it and people got uncomfortable. You know, I saw the opposite when the George Floyd protest happened. I received emails because people wanted more things to happen faster. And I think you have to talk about it. And I think that's step one, but some people are not equipped to talk about it. So that's where the training goes in. But I think conversation is to me step one and building the infrastructure and the strategic plans and empowering staff to have a voice and creating the programs based on their needs. But I think it starts with the conversation. Yeah, and you yeah have I think we have to recognize that um, it will be uncomfortable. There's no getting around it. It's going to be mm -hmm. uncomfortable. Uh, we will say the wrong thing. We will mess up. We will put our foot in our, as I did. I tell you, as an assistant dean for diversity, uh, we won't always get it right. And to think you will, will set you up for failure. Um, the term safe space, psychological safety has uh, been brought up numerous times. And again, I'm, I'm always controversial and maybe a little antagonistic, but we also have to recognize that we have colleagues that will never feel safe, no matter what you think you're doing to provide because of their experiences. Again, because of generations 400 plus years of legalized, you know, legalized racism, discrimination, um, and trauma, the trauma is real. So we have to recognize that um, it may take some of our colleagues a little longer to feel safe if they ever get there at all. Um, I've started using a newer terminology rather than a safe space, um, having a brave space, because brave means that you're going to to talk about the difficult things. It means that you're going to have to find the courage to say things that are challenging. Uh, I also pretty much um, challenge you all <laughs> that are called to say, trying to provide safety is important, don't get me wrong, but recognizing that you, your colleagues may not feel safe. I don't think it's safe for me in some settings, so I think that's important. Um, yeah being brave and having brave spaces, knowing you'll mess up, knowing you'll get it wrong. It's all part of learning. Um, we have not done this. We've not done it. It's new for, for many of us. You're going to get it wrong. Um, and when you get it wrong, don't put um, an individual in the position of having to make you feel better after you've gotten it wrong. Apologize and move on, don't make a big deal out of it. You've said the wrong thing, I am so sorry. Um, and, and, and if you have to cry or whatever, leave the room and cry, but don't make it about you. But uncomfortable is just going, we're gonna to have to be, as Dewey said, comfortable being uncomfortable. And I, I knew Dewey and I were, we were participating last night on a National Black Nurses Association Greater New York City call and we talked about bravery that's required to have these conversations and so I, I completely agree. Great. But we're doing um, in the next couple of weeks at New York City Health and Hospitals, we're holding empowering voice sessions for staff. It's anonymous, but to your point, Lisa, some people may not trust it that it's anonymous, but you're able to call in and articulate and express your frustrations or anger about what's transpired recently and also provide suggestions. So just thinking of different ways and avenues to really listen to our staff where uh, they may not feel comfortable. So what does it look like? What, did they just call into like a hotline? 
they call into a hotline and wow. a company is actually um, taking notes and they're able to say, you know, this is not working, you haven't done anything. And there are bookends to the questions um, okay. that really um, provide hope and inspiration. But nevertheless, we will use that feedback to then create our strategic plan for equity and access. So we're really wow. excited about it. But it's for that 2,000 employees and it's a, it's a step. It's a step and we hope that a, the 2,000 employees are brave to just tell us what they really think without wow. knowing who they are. And they might be scared. And they might be scared. They yeah. might be scared. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we have to do too is that we have to lead by example. Um, we have to be able to recognize when there is microaggression or there is implicit bias that's around us and be able to call someone out on it. And that doesn't mean that you're gonna embarrass them in the middle of the nursing station, but it's just having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Cause I've, I've seen it. I've seen where you'll have African-Americans come in the organization and they'll be like, oh, which rehab is the patient going? Oh, let's send to subacute. Why are we sending the patient to subacute? The patient is 27 years old. Oh, they're homeless. I said, do you know their background? And these are some of the conversations that I would have. What's the patient background? Oh, they might be homeless just two days ago because of some event that happened. And then when you start digging a little bit deeper, you realize that this person actually have insurance and can make it to an acute. So as leaders as well, and as just individual, just people, we have to be make, we have to ensure that we're looking at these little things and be able to call someone out on it. Right. And so we have to treat everyone equal. Everyone needs to get the same opportunity. This is a 37 year old and we're gonna try our best. Let's try our best. And when our best fails, then we can say that we tried our best. Right. So I'm going to ask another question from one of um, our Q&A boxes. Um, questions. Um, this question um, is from a nurse that asks, what is the best way to address a patient or family member who states that they want a different caregiver than the one assigned because of their race? Anyone want to take it? I could take it. Isn't it, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's, a whole, there's a whole book on it. I forget the name of that. Um, uh, the author wrote about um, uh, the family. I think it was a, a family that came in and she was having, they were having a baby. Um, it was happened on the maternity ward and the family um, refused to let the black nurse take care of their child. I can't remember the name of it. Um, and that, that nurse ended up being traumatized because they, uh, her white colleagues did not, they realized what was happening and they did not step in to intervene and say to this family, you know, this person is here to take care of them. There's nothing wrong with their skill set. They're excellent caregiver, et cetera. Um, so in, in keeping with that theme, we, we have to be able to support our colleagues um, in that endeavor. And when we realize that there are patients who are out there and for nothing less than their skin color, they're saying they don't want a provider to take care of them, we have, we have to practice what we preach. There are so many people watching. Stories fly like wild. And all it takes is one instance of a patient who says, I don't want this nurse to take care of me. Um, and we realize it's because of skin color um, it only takes one instance for us to lo uh, lose the faith of the people who look to us for guidance, to look to us to create those brave spaces. Because the next time we go to create that brave space, they're going to say, uh-uh, I saw what happened last week. Uh, so if we're very clear that this patient or family member does not want a provider or a nurse, a nursing assistant, whoever it may be, taking care of them because of, because of skin color, we have to intervene and we have to make it clear that that's not acceptable in our institution. Unequivocally, we have, to be able to do that. And we have to do it publicly, not publicly uh, to uh, embarrass or um, I'll shame anyone, but just the same way they'll, our uh, employees will see when we don't get it right, they'll also know when we do get it right. And that will allow us to create the culture that we're looking to create. Yeah, it has to be a conversation. There is, there is, I'm not the person that is quick to tell 
if a patient requests another nurse to say, okay, let me do that transition. I, I am not. I'm the first one to walk into the room, have a seat and have a dialogue. We need to discuss what is the reason, what's the rationale behind that. And if it's regarding skin color, then I need to let them know that's not our organization. That's not what we stand for. That's not our mission. That's not our vision. This is not what we really do here. There, And then I will actually get, a lot of times I like to get ally. So I'll get the physicians to go in with me when we have situations. And then we go in and we all have a conversation because we have to make sure that people do understand that that is not the vision. That's not the goal of our organization. We don't look at skin color. Is this person equipped? Are they actually educated? Do they have all the tools need to take care of you? Yes, they do. Okay, that's your nurse. But you also don't want the nurse to feel uncomfortable either walking into the room. So it's like a reverse. So that's when you'll have a dialogue with the nurse as well and say, how do you feel? Are you comfortable walking back in that room? Because you also need to make sure that your staff is safe. So you know, you're going to set a foundation with the patient, but I need to make sure that my team is okay as well. So, cause they are my priority. I feel like if my team is safe, if they're happy caring for patient, then the patients will be happy. So it's a, it's a double edged sword, but you still have to address the patient. I agree. Okay, another question from our Q and A box um, says, given the hierarchy of nursing leadership nationwide is largely white, how do we promote more black nurse leaders into power positions? Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> so um, if they're qualified, you probably and they and you've interviewed and you've gone through the entire process, put them there. Mm -hmm. Right. There it. it is. I don't I strongly believe if I'm qualified to be a nurse, if I'm qualified to be a nurse manager. What makes me not qualified to be a director? Is it that I need certain tools? And what are you gonna do to provide those tools? Are you gonna mentor me because there are things within me that need a little bit more mentorship? So if there is no, I, I, I cannot really find reasons and rational. And that's the reason why I follow, and Natalia can speak to this a little bit more than I can because she went through the program with Dr. Yvonne Wesley when I was going to be doing my doctorate program, I spoke to my colleague, um, Kimberly Jean Louise, and we discussed what would be dynamic. What is something that we would do? And I was doing my research and I run into Dr. W Yvonne Wesley paper and he talked about the LIBN and I reach out to her and she actually met me in a library in New Jersey and we discuss it. But it's like, we know this has been going on for years that African-Americans hit that glass ceiling. And a lot of time the glass ceiling is being a nurse manager. So what are some of the things, what do we need to put in place in order to move them beyond? Because right now it's sometimes it's not even glass, it's concrete ceiling. It's like you can't even break through it. So if someone is qualified and it doesn't mean that I need to work 10 times as hard to be considered qualified, if I'm doing the work, then I should be able to kind of see progress within my career. I shouldn't be bottleneck into a situation just because you don't think I'm good enough because of the stereotype. So that's my feeling on it. I agree with that. I feel like I have to say something. You must. <laughs> uh, I feel that um, I agree with you, Dewey. I think opportunities should be given. I also think that you know, I've talked about mentorship. I also think about interviewing the organization and, and, and thinking about your own success. So I don't think about a title. I think about the impact you can have in whatever role that is, right? And so really, um, you know, people ask, you know, why did I get a DNP? I got a DNP because I loved the classes I would take to, to obtain a DNP. You know, why did I become a system chief nurse executive at New York City Health and Hospitals? Because I believe in the mission and vision of the organization. So I think once you really connect with your purpose in life, with, your, with, with what you're passionate about, you know, that's my headliner on Twitter, you know, follow your passion, I think the opportunities hopefully will come. Um, I know that I'm... I'm Thinking from my own personal lens, I'm speaking from my own experience um, with great mentorship, but I also think that, Dewey, you're phenomenal, and I think you have to think about the organization that's worthy of you being their director and just thinking about that in your search. Yeah. <clears throat> that's right. So, um, Dewey, <laughs> um, we have a member, we have a question from a member of our 
NYU um, Nursing Administration Alumni Advisory Council, Stephen Tyler, who's a former <laughs> classmate of yours. Um, he says he wants to first thank you for all those uncomfortable moments in class. They were all important learning opportunities. And then he asked a question that earlier there was a discussion about the need to create actionable items to uproot systemic racism. Can anyone on the panel share actionable items that they are working on at their workplaces currently that might be helpful to other leaders in the audience? So I will say one thing, but this is a Dewey question. Sorry, but the one I'll thing that I think about, say, can, I, can I just say <laughs> Anyone <this>? can answer. <laughs> okay, I was the last part-time evening program at NYU. And I talk about this even when I won the Estelle Osborne Award. And as an African-American woman, as a black woman, I had to work full time to go to nursing school. It was my second degree. When you think about the barriers we face for education, and if it were not for the evening classes that I was able to take, I would not be a nurse here today. So I, I, I think about, you know, making sure that when we think about, you know, uh, the opportunities from education. So what am I doing about it? Right now, I'm working with CUNY to develop pathways for LPNs, for associate degree nurses to obtain baccalaureates. I, I think that, you know, they can't afford it, a lot of people. You know, the classes are during the day they have to work. And so I think... You know, we have to, whether it's lean on minority um, adjunct faculty to teach those evening classes. You know, I've heard so many reasons, you know, that no one wants to teach an evening shift. People would volunteer for free if that meant another black nurse graduating. And I think we have to really think about the opportunities um, that nurses have to, to become a baccalaureate prepared. I think about BSN in 10 and my mission and my role in that, making sure that there are more baccalaureate prepared nurses because they select programs they can afford. So I just think about that. It connects with me personally and deeply. And, and I'm committed to make a difference to make sure that nurses with associate degrees can practice in New York in the future. Yeah. and. Um... And I can answer that question. So some of the actionable item, and I can speak on NYU because that's within the organization, the framework that I do work, is that when I brought the conversation to Dr. Glassman and talk about the underrepresentation of ethnic minority, in two seconds she was on it. She was like, absolutely. And we started that program. And um, unfortunately, right when we were finishing, it was when she actually um, retired from NYU, but what she did prior to leaving was that she connected me with the diversity and inclusion officer that was just on board in within the organization. And one of the things that she told them was that I want this program to live on within the organization. So, and then right after that, we have COVID and everything just uprooted, but that's a program that's gonna continue. But what I would like to see follow through with that is that not only do we complete a program, but we need to select people within that group and do a fellowship with them. We have to be able to say, okay, these are some of the other things that we're gonna do. Yes, we brought you through a program, the learning part, but what else are we gonna do beyond that? And then I've seen positions being created. If people are good in certain roles, it doesn't have to be a director, but it has to be something else. Another thing that NYU gave, um, and Laura Mansfield is one of the person that is on top of this with me, is that I go to Albany all the time. We go and we discuss um, nursing. So these are some of the pathway that they have to create within the organization to make others be able, because before that, I've never been to Albany on Capitol Hill to talk about um, staff and ratio and all those things but they have afforded those um, opportunities. So now I do have those things to say, okay, these are some of the tools that I do possess and I can live on with it. So actionable item is things that you can put in place that you're gonna see an impact from. And it doesn't have to be because there's a limited amount of position in those director role, but what else will this person be able to do within the organization that is gonna be impactful? As Natalia mentioned earlier. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, so uh, one question from the audience says, to what do you can attribute your success? Why do some Blacks succeed in a system that seems to be designed for us to fail? I could take that question. You know, um, so I, I, I can speak for myself, but I'm sure Natalia, Lisa, Dewey would have the same answer. It's hard. And anyone, I mean, 
leadership period is hard. Anytime you have to lead a group of people, anything that you're doing, if you, Natalia talked about um, passion and following your passion. If you're following your passion, it's excruciatingly difficult and there are challenges that come bumps in the road. Um, but I think to what, what I attribute my success is um, having people in my corner who have, um, despite the challenges, despite what I've seen, um, despite the barriers, um, people in my corner who have really sponsored and mentored and coached me. I, I would say that's one. Um, two, I'm, I'm constantly trying to learn. I, I have never seen a problem that I did not insist I need to solve. Mm. And so my personality has, I think, lends itself to figuring out a way to break down, go around, go under, go over some of the barriers that I face. Uh, mm. So if you tell me no, uh, you might have a problem because I'll figure out a way to get it done. That's number two. And number three, I keep thinking to myself, I do not want to be 99 years old because I'm going to be 99. <laughs> I don't want to be 99 years old sitting on my porch. I'm going to be, I'm going to have a, a, maybe a farm somewhere, a nice house with a rocking chair on the porch. And I don't want to sit on that rocking chair having regrets and saying I should have. And so even with the most difficult challenges, even with the barriers, even with a system that's set up and designed not to allow someone like me to uh, succeed, I don't take it personal, but I always remember, I don't want to have any regrets there. And having really seeking out and finding mentors and having mentors, people who are pushing me, um, um, has allowed me to succeed. And again, I don't think I have a, any, there's nothing in my DNA that says quit. So here I am. And I'm going to, in 30 seconds, it's like, you have to know your purpose and you have to know who you are. No one can define me. When I walk into a room, I know I'm black. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> so that's one thing. It's already out there. As soon as I walk in, I know exactly who I am. And then you have to know your purpose. What drives you? What are some of the things that drives you? What is your goal? And what's your ambition? And how are you going to get there? So it's, it's a little bit more difficult for us. But you have to know exactly who you are. And you have to know your purpose. And you don't need to, you know, you're, you know, you're African American, you know, you're black American, whatever we call ourselves, but just know who you are and what your purpose is. And those are some of the things that drive me every single day. And I just don't get upset over the small things, the minor things. I always say, I'm not going to take things home with me in my bed. When I go in my bed, I need to have a fresh start. I don't need to be thinking about the worries that is behind me. So just know who you are and your purpose. I agree with that. And, and I'll quickly answer as well. You know, I have to start off with my faith. You know, I'm a woman of faith. And so I think that has sustained me. My parents, my father is crazy in a good way. Um, you know, I had no choice but to succeed. Um, and, you know, so it starts with, I think, a great support system, you know, yeah. whether it's my siblings that really um, just, just, just pour in a lot of positivity in me. And I know this is a recording and I know my, my bosses, my old bosses might watch this. And I just want to say that I have been truly blessed with the best bosses that do not look like me, that saw something in me beyond color. And where every performance appraisal was a true assessment of their, of their opinion in terms of what I need to work on. And I adhered to those performance appraisals and I delivered. And I think because of the great mentorship, the great bosses I've had and the great experiences from NYU, from NYP, from Sinai to now in New York City Health and Hospitals, I've been fortunate. Um, and, and so that is why, you know, I really believe in giving back and mentoring. But I, I think, um, Without a great support system, I would not be here today because of the systemic racism that has impacted, whether it's education, finances, opportunities, you name it, that's deeply rooted uh, for many uh, Black people to not succeed, unfortunately. Great, Natalia. I have to get back from that. Yeah. And also, if we give up, there the are people who are watching us. And, you know, there are people with brown skin who are looking and saying, wow, Natalia did it, Lisa did it, Dewey did it. And I, that sticks in the back of my mind. My daughters, you know, if mom gives up, what hope do I have to, how can I turn to them and say, look, you've got to do it for the next generation. So um, 
it, it's keeping that in mind that leaving that legacy is something that I'm, that I'm always thinking about and I'm part of that, uh, creating that legacy and opening up those doors. So our, one of our audience members wanted to share that NYU obstetrics department completed an implicit bias training and they have a Black Mothers Matter Committee and workplace culture inclusion department that meets with leadership. So yeah, so those are nice, I guess, some actionable items that our audience can take back to their organizations. So we are now out of time, but me and Brene and our NYU Alumni Council Committee would love to thank each and every one of you for being so open and candid and honest and having this discussion with us. So thank you guys so much. Um, and this is, this is great. Unfortunately, it didn't seem like we have enough time, but thank you guys. Thank you for all attending to all the people on the line watching us and this important topic. This is such a great discussion. And um, from the bottom of my heart, um, I want to thank all of the panelists for just having the courage to talk with us and really have this discussion. So we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Take care. Bye-bye.